here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to hit our Father's Word again. Micah of the Minor Prophets. You know, it's one of the only titles of a book in God's Word that is a question. And Micah being, rather than transliterated, let's translate it, and it means, who is like Yah? And who is like our Father? Nobody. I mean, bar none, no one is like our Father. We are very fortunate to have a Father that was the creator of all things, and yet He has time for you because He loves you. Now, Micah, the first three chapters are threatenings. It's a promise of what He's going to do to the people that disobey Him. So, uh, and we're in the third chapter. We're going to pick it up with the fourth verse here in a minute. And we've got to go all the way through to verse 12 into threatenings. And then when we get to chapter 4, we go into consolation. This is to let you know wherever you are or whatever time it is in God's plan of correction, threatenings, or so forth, as long as you're doing what's right, He's going to protect you. You don't have anything to worry about. He will take care of his own. Who is like Yah? No one. So, with that having been said, still in the threatenings from chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 12. Let's complete it. Let's pick it up with verse um, 4 in the threatenings. He's, he's saying here, uh, the leaders of our people like to rip, our, rip the people off begging for money or, or some other thing. Uh, I mean, getting to them on usury, uh, getting to them any way they can. Government, church, the whole smash that's against God. They just like to, he said, they, they even get it down so bad in verse 3 where we completed the last lecture that they just about flay the skin and then lay you out in the pot to see how much fat they can render. Okay? In other words, they use you. Make, make sure you don't get caught up in usury. It's the biggest waste of money and labor in the world is uh, to get yourself caught up with, uh, uh, I guess the worst thing is credit cards that have a high rate of interest and you get entrapped. If you need to borrow money, don't borrow it from a credit card. Th that isn't hard to learn, is it? If you have to use a credit card, pay it off every month where you don't get into that high usury. Uh, chapter 3, verse 4, let's go with it, as they're talking about the leaders flaying the people, robbing them. Verse 4, and it reads, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, that's to say the people when they're flayed out and in trouble, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. In other words, they didn't want to hear him. They didn't want to hear the truth. So what is God going to do to them? God is going to allow them to see that um, uh, he does, if, they, if they don't love him, if they do not meet the conditions of having done justly, he's not, he's not going to do anything for them. Why should he? You take some old boy that goes out and doesn't take care of his family, rips, gambles, and uh, what have you, and takes, uh, takes grocery money from his family and uh, spends it somewhere else, and then all of a sudden he has a bad time and starts crying to God. Why, why should, he's worse than a heathen as it's written in the book of Timothy. Why should God pay any attention to him? Until he can really get honest and repent, he's in trouble. Why, do, as it said before in chapter 2, don't listen to the sputterer preachers that never quite get around to teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but give you one verse and then tell you what they think. It's what your father says. If you want your father to hear you, then you'd better listen to what your father says. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets, those sputters, false prophets, that make my people err. 
that bite with their teeth and cry peace, and he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Against who? Against our Father. Now, there's a lot left from this in the translation. It's just a, a really a, what this has to do with is your false prophets at the Baal altars. What they did, the olive is symbolic of peace. And at the Baal altar, they would put an olive in their mouth and promise peace. And without the olive, they promise war. So he said, in other words, what is he saying? What is Babel? It's confusion. They don't know what they're doing. And let that be a lesson to you. The very olive itself in the Hebrew tongue is Eliyah, Father's name. That's why it's blessed. That's why when someone is sick, you anoint them with the oil of our people. Olive oil, he instructed you to. You want them to get well? Anoint them. Well, I didn't know that was for Christians. Then you're ignorant and don't know what the word Christ means. It means the anointing, the anointed one. So you better get yourself in gear and learn what pleases your Father, whereby he can bless you instead of turns his back on you. A lot of people like to play church, and God just doesn't seem to hear them. Well, maybe he's busy. No, maybe it's what you're doing. Now, our fathers sent these threatenings to wake people up. you got to make real sure that your prophet or your preacher isn't practicing some of the practices of Baal, all right? It's, this is why Jesus would say, uh, as it is written in the New Testament. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, we've healed in your name. We've cast out demons in your name. And he said, you get away from me. I never knew you. you got to make sure which Christ it is you're following. Certainly you don't want to follow the flyaway one. You know who that is? That is the spurious Messiah. And as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 18, God says, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. You want to be careful how you pick your friends, dear one. And make sure most of all that you're not, that you have knowledge concerning God's word so that he does not turn his back on you. What he's saying here is they practice, they bite with their teeth the olive and promise peace, peace, peace. And what? listen, wake up. What are you here today? Where is the main war at today or conflict? Iraq. What is Iraq? It's a Babylon of old. Even within it is the city Ur from which Abraham came. You better be awake and watch. Things are happening before your very eyes. Well, thank goodness our church doesn't practice any of this olive biting or Babylonian practices. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you be careful. Quick like a bunny. Got an Easter bunny. It's not biblical. It was a fertility rite it held in the spring. And the eggs of fertility they roll from Ishtar, which was a heathen goddess, and they call it Easter. It's kind of sad, my friend, when you see what has slipped into uh, and upon innocent people by false prophets and false shepherds. Well, is there any harm in it? Well, I don't know. Stick around and find out. Try it on Jesus when he returns, all right? See what he thinks about it. You're betting your soul on it. I, I would rather do it God's way by his word. Well, are you being hard on people? Uh, these are threatenings by our Father. He said, I won't listen to you if you're not right with me, okay? Practice what, like what they do at a Baal altar instead of in a church of God one following my ways. Uh, verse 6 to continue. Therefore, you see, I'm, I say to them, he says to them, night shall be unto you that you shall not have a vision and it shall be dark unto you that you shall not divine 
and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. That means there's no truth in them. Oh, but they have such nice words. It makes you feel good. Well, does it really? Do you know, do you know who the prince of darkness is? Don't you think you, know, you need to come into the light? Christ is the light. If you're in him, you're never in darkness. And divining means to see a th vision of divination, which is to say, really presented by Almighty God. You're not going to get there by, false, uh, by practicing false practices that are against the word of God. Forget it. It's not going to happen. Verse 7. Then shall the seers, do you know what a seer is? That, that's a prophet, okay? Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. They're not going to know what's going on. Come here from Sikkim. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Covering their lips for a prophet is a, a sign of shame. They're going to be ashamed of themselves. Um, you know, when you're praying, you need to pray to the eternal. You want to make sure that you're not praying to a spurious Messiah where Jesus will say, I never knew you. The first Messiah that returns is not the true. God's word makes it clear over and over and over. And you need to be informed of that. Yep, and lips sealed or lips ashamed when it comes to um, prophets. Verse 8, but truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. God says, my word will convict you of it. Uh, many might think God is being a little hard here. No, he isn't. He's correcting. He's threatening. And believe you me, our Father keeps his word. He will do what he says. I, w I would really be concerned if I thought that God had turned his back on me and I couldn't reach him, if he couldn't hear me. I would really be nervous because it's a wicked old world out there. And a man or a woman or a child without God is in bad shape, really bad shape. Bad things happen to them. And what can you do for them? Nothing except teach God's word. They're still going to mess up over and over and over until they come to repentance and receive, get to a point on high ground. By that I mean a higher mode of thinking whereby they'll talk to our Father, and Father will answer them and bless them and straighten their lives out. Verse 9, hear this, I pray you. He, he wants his children to listen. Ye heads of the house of Jacob, ye leaders, and the princes of the house of Israel, I want all of the tribes to hear, you that are, are responsible, government elected officials, uh, prophets, ministers, leaders, all, that abhor, that is to say, hate judgment and pervert all uh, equity. In other words, um, all fairness, you just throw out the window. And you, you don't want, uh, you hate that that is just. Hey, our, our um, legal system is so corrupt. I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. It would seem that the law of precedent pretty soon comes to the point. God's words tells us what to do about perversion. And would you believe that we have high boards among the leaders that feel they can override God's word and put a pervert in charge of the church? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think God's going to do about that? Well, you'll find out. You see, within the leadership, 
If they don't, they, it would seem they just simply hate to do what's right. We get in conflict. And do you know what? When it comes to our legal system of choosing judges, Christians need not apply. Now that's a disgrace. And you need to mark anyone that sails their little boat with that particular uh, cut into the wind. Because all it is is a bunch of wind. Mark them well. Christians need not apply. Anyone with high morals should not apply for the judicial system. Where did this come from? What do you think God is going to do about this? Stick around and find out when we have men and women in harm's way. We have certain people that like to stand in the way of progress. Shame on them. Shame. Well, is that political what you're saying? No, it has nothing to do with politics. I'm talking about idiots that would close the door on Christians. Verse 10, that build up Zion with blood. They don't care if our people get killed. And Jerusalem with iniquity, that's to say deceit and lies. Verse 11, the heads thereof judge for reward. They take bribes. You can bribe them into anything. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to vote for you, dear brother, but I need to build a bridge for my people back home and take down back another lot of big pork fat down there healthy for the people. Then I'll sign it. What, what do we have for leaders? Now, I know we've got some very good leaders, but God knew beforehand we would have some that would be pretty cruddy as well. Well, are you judging? No, this is God's word. Take a bribe. And the priests thereof teach for hire. They don't care about souls. They don't care about how much good or, or to be really um, innovative whereby you can find a way to take God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and reach people. You see, these are threatenings, my friend, not from me, but from the Word of God. And the prophets thereof divine for money. If you got $500, we'll put you in our prayer line. <laughs> yeah, maybe you will, maybe you won't be healed. And you know, a funny thing about these prayer lines, I, I've never seen one of them yet anoint with the oil of our people as James chapter 5 says a Christian must. I, I wonder what's wrong. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? Is this not a Christian church? Uh, none evil can come upon us. Well, when God turns his back on them, I guess they'll find out. You know, we thank God for the good churches we have in this nation where you have pastors that make a stand. You know, a pastor that won't make a stand is worthless. If a man won't stand for something, you know, I, I personally would rather have a strong, opinionated person that's willing to make a stand for what he or she believes than I would a wimp that'll flow this way or that way or whichever the way the wind's blowing. Because God can always correct and use somebody that has morals whereby they will take a stand. And I hope we have enough Christians in this nation to morally take a stand for that that is right. Wake up and help out the leaders of our nation. They really need to be helped out. Some of them all the way out. Verse 12. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Do you know what he's talking about? That day when Jesus would walk from Jerusalem and they would say, Master, look, look at these buildings. They're fantastic. He said, there will come a day that there will not be one stone standing atop another. And naturally, that's after the false Messiah would reign there. He's not here yet, but he's on his way. 
and Christ is going to level it for the cleansing of the Millennium Temple. It's going to happen. Well, that concludes the threatenings. Thank goodness. They're tough. They're rough. But do you know something? God's paddle saves souls. God's correction is because he loves someone. God's word can offend some people. But grow for it. You'll heal up real good. Why? God loves his children. But when you leave God out of the equation, do you understand now why Micah is the title of this book? Who is like Yah? No one can help you against Yah. That's why in, in um, the earlier chapter, in chapter 1, he said, you, better, you can hook the fastest horse you want to to your chariot and run as fast as you want to, and God can just reach out and pluck you right back. You can't run from God. Let's, let's cover a few consolations here and get away from the threatenings because I, I, I assume none of you need threatenings from God because you follow him anyway, right? You like to study his word. You like to be what is just. That means simply trying to do what's right. I wish some of us were perfect. I guess none of us are. I, at least I don't know anybody except from Christ himself that is perfect, but at least he paid the price for forgiveness that we can get up and go again. Chapter 4, verse 1, we begin the, the consolations. But in the last days, it shall come to pass. Did it say maybe? Uh-uh. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. Naturally, that's the Millennium Temple from the prior verse of he leveling the field. When his feet touched the Mount of Olives, a way is open to the east gate and cleansed. Not one stone atop another. And rebuilding it for that, you know, uh, the... the um, uh, above the hills or the highest place on the hill is where God is worshipped always. When, when you're out on a documentary and you find, uh, even if you find some Baal markings where there were Baal worshippers there, uh, if you'll just go up a little higher and look around, you'll find a fish or some sign of Christianity or of Yah, if it happened to be of that type or Iberian, whichever, you'll find a true symbol of God higher yet, okay? Because um, there are prophets, uh, there are priests that have always wandered the earth. We know that from finding their writings and so forth in stone. God says in the last days, we're winning, we're taking over. Doesn't matter. We're going to build and establish the house of God and people are going to flow to it from all over the world. As it is written on the first day of the millennium, every knee will bow to Almighty God. They really won't have much choice because there won't be any false preachers or anything else there. They're going to see it in person what is transpiring. Verse 2, And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, that's to say in his ways. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word, the what? The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The word of the Lord is the most important thing. You know why? In the world today. Because this earth age is going to change. It has already changed once from the first earth age. But as it is written in Mark chapter 13, God's word never changes. You can count on it. You can depend on it. That's why the knowledge from it should be absorbed in your mind because it will always lead you on the right path whereby you will not go astray. And our Father loves it. It pleases Him when you choose that 
path. Will, it will be wonderful when people will say, let's be taught by the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, rather than playing church. You know, I, I know there are well-meaning people in the world. If you do not teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and you pick one verse for a subject, my sermon today, will the text will be pulled from blah, blah, blah one verse. Do you know how many years it takes you to make it through God's Word? Six hundred and something years. I don't think any of you are going to live that long. So how much of God's Word are you truly going to absorb? Can you tell me where things are discussed and orders are given in God's Word to cause blessings to your family? It's there. God did not leave us wanting for advice. It's here. There is no sin in not knowing. It's a sin to not learn. And I, I, I know our Father, when these people want to be taught, and it is for this reason in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, 6, you will find there will be teachers in that millennium time because there are priests, and they will be teaching the Word of God in the millennium as it is today, for God's Word never changes. Verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, those that need it. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now naturally you know this has not come to pass. Well, why hasn't it come to pass? Well, because the last days period of de facto were not here yet, but we're getting there. When you are advised to beat your swords into plowshares, you're in the millennium then, friend. God, uh, the Son of God has returned to this earth, established His kingdom on God's favorite place in the world as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 16, Mount Zion where he intends to establish the Millennium Temple forever and ever and ever, the final temple. And when he says you don't need your to that learn war anymore, why? God's going to fight our battles for us. Squish, squish. This is why God in Ezekiel 38 and 39 destroys Gog, Haman Gog, and Armageddon. Because you've got too many people that says there's no such thing as God. Stick around, friend. He's going to smoke you. He's not going to let us do it so that you know for one and all times there is a God and He is going to smoke you. First, that's to say if you are in the bad. But why be, why be in the wrong when you can be blessed even today? It uh, doesn't make sense to me. I would much rather be blessed of God today in prosperity, in health, and in comfort than I would to, to be out in the world without God in the darkness. Come to the light. The light is the Word of God. Verse 4, But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. He said it. That's it. Nothing else need be said. Now think back, if you would, to verse 3 of the prior chapter where he said, those leaders, you can plant your fields, but those leaders are going to strip you clean bare. They're going to flay your skin, the very skin off your body, that, which means it's a spiritual, in a spiritual sense, they're going to take everything you've got and they could care less. You know, many people will say, well, uh, I, I just can't believe that. I've never had that happen. Oh, 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 I'm sorry if it hasn't happened to you. You know, that, it, that you're, you're in a good place. But do you, do you own your own home? Is it all paid for? If you, well, God bless you if it is. But if it isn't, let's say that you paid $100,000 for a, a piece of property. And, and just to, to round it out so it's easy to figure, 10% 10, 10 interest. 
well, how much is 10% interest on $100,000? Well, you know, the interest itself, do you know how much they rip off? And maybe you get $100 on your principal, and guess what you work for all year? Not yourself. They ripped you off, friend. They cleaned your plow. They took your money, and you're happy about it. As a matter of fact, you brought your, you bought and paid for your own prison that they don't even have to have a guard out there to watch you to take care of the money they loaned you. You're going to stay there and work it out. Uh, $10,000 to them and $1,000 to you. I don't like those odds. A lot of people are getting flayed and filleted and rendered, and they don't even know it. They think it's wonderful. There is a day coming, as this verse 4 stipulates, that when you plant a field and you reap, the land will be yours. See, it belongs to our Father. It doesn't belong to a bank. It doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to our Father. He lets us use it, and we'll get a title to it occasionally. But when we die, it goes on to somebody else. It, it belongs to God. And then when he gives it to his children, the consolation is there won't be anybody taking a percentage of what you've got. It's yours. That's what your father giving it to you proudly and gladly and, uh, and in love. Verse 5, for all people will walk every one in the name of his God. Notice the small g there, lowercase. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God, uppercase, Yahweh, forever and ever, always, never failing to be with him because he will be with us on the last day of the millennium, the full Godhead de jure here on earth. And and there will never be anything that offends again. You see, our Father has a right to correct. Why? He doesn't want you to miss out. Why? He loves you. You're his child. You don't like any of your children to just be put out forever and, and be gone, disappear, blotted out. Well, God doesn't either. Our Father, Yahweh, he wants you to make it. Therefore, he brings the threatenings. And now these blessings whereby you can see, verse 6, In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, that, that one that, that uh, has a problem, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. I have afflicted? Has God afflicted someone? Well, he sure has. He did it for their own good. He afflicted them in a way in Romans chapter 11 when he said only 7,000 are not going to bow to the Antichrist because some of them I have sent the spirit. God said, I have sent them the spirit of slumber it is in the English. The word in the Greek is stupor, and they go through life in a stupor. They don't really know what's happening, and you know something? They don't really care as long as they live from paycheck to paycheck. Just get by, from, you know, on and on. Get by. Let me go fishing every once in a while. Let me do this thing I like, just paycheck to paycheck. You know, it's sad, but God sent the spirit of stupor on them because in that, then they are innocent because he will remove that stupor and they will be taught, but they will also be tested at the very end of the millennium and they will either take part in the second resurrection or they will go to hell, which is to say march into the fiery pit. It's, it's their choice. God doesn't send anyone there. A person chooses to go there by his or her actions. So yeah, God, God will make everything right, that everybody has an even playing field. And some of you right now are saying, well, is he teaching a second chance? My dear friend, they didn't have a prayer of a chance to start with, was what's taught many times in this world. 
So you want to listen to your father's word, not man, not this man or any other man. Check them out. Make it whole water from God's word. All right. Hey, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?